Yeah, hello everybody. Welcome back to the course on optical properties of nanomaterials. In this part of this course, we will focus on the optical properties of metal nanoparticles, and especially uh, you will see how localized surface plasmon resonances can be observed in such nanoparticles. Just um, a quick recap what we discussed last week. We focused on the optical properties or the dielectric properties of metals as a bulk. And um, this was known as, or is known as the Trude model for the dielectric function. We realized that in comparison to dielectric materials, metals have free electrons. And that means we needed to um, modify our equation of motion for, to describe the movement of electrons. And in short, there was no restoring force because the free electrons are not bound by the nucleus. No restoring force translates into the absence of a resonance frequencies. Uh, resonance frequency in um, this Trude model and then we discussed the resulting properties or changes of these dielectric functions when we when we modify it and then for example we saw that metals are reflective below the plasma frequency and transparent above the frequency and also they are dominated by losses or by k by the imaginary part of the reflective index below the plasma frequency and by the real part of the reflective index above the plasma frequency. Okay, this are the difference to dielectric materials. And today, now we want to focus on what happens if we make the metal very small and discuss the optical properties of a nanoparticle. So what we want to learn is really what changes if we make the metal very small. And what we will see in a second is that this gives rise to the emergence of what is known as a localized surface plasmon resonance. And this resonance can um, describe the color of nanoparticles. So a few more recaps on um, optical properties of small materials that we discussed in the context of dielectric nanoparticles. The first is that if the particle becomes very small, we can use an electrostatic approximation. Maybe let me directly show this here. So the electric field of a light wave, or the length, the wavelength of the light wave is much larger than the particle. So at every moment in time, this particle experiences a constant electric field. Oh. Now, if the electric field moves, this will change, but everywhere in the particle, it will be the same. If we have an electric field acting on a particle, we already discussed that the electrons will be displaced by the electric field, and that means that we have a separation between parts of the nanoparticle that is more positively charged. This is where the um, ions of the lattice, the positively charged ions, reside, and all the electrons that are being pushed back and go to the other side, so you get a dipole. And then we have seen that when the, the wave now moves across this material, these electrons are constantly oscillating between up and down, you know, depending on the orientation of the electric field in the light wave. And this oscillating, um, oscillated charges, or accelerated charges um, that occur during this oscillation give rise to a new electric field that is being radiated outwards. And as this oscillates, we get a light wave that goes out of the particle. And this is what we have discussed in the context of Rayleigh scattering as the scattered wave that goes out of the particles. OK, so now uh, the dielectric, uh, the electrostatic approximation. And in the context of Rayleigh scattering, we also discussed or derived expressions for the magnitude of scattering and absorption. And this is just something I want to show you before we uh, start the discussion of metal nanoparticles. So very generally, the scattering cross-section of a small particle, and mind you, this was not only derived for dielectric particles. So at no point in the derivation did we use the Lorentz function of, or the Lorentz model of the dielectric function. We simply looked at the wave that goes out of the particle. And then we integrated, or we, we looked at the pointing vector, so the energy that out, goes out um, along with this wave, and then we integrated the pointing vector over uh, the entire particle, and that, at the end of the day, gave rise to this scattering cross-section. So how much light intensity is going out of the particle? And that is described by this function here. So we see it's a function of alpha. The absorption is also a function of the imaginary part of alpha. And then we derived an expression for this alpha, which is the polarizability of the material. And we saw that alpha is, can, be called, or, or can be derived as 4 pi d, which is the diameter of the particle, times this expression that includes the dielectric um, functions or the refractive indices of the particle and of the medium. So we saw that we can 
um, increase scattering if we increase the diameter and if we increase the refractive index contrast, so the difference between the refractive index of the particle and the refractive index of the medium. So this is kind of the recap where we stand, what's kind of the, the state of the art. And now we want to implement or discuss what changes if now instead of a small dielectric particle, let's say silicon dioxide, we use a metal nanoparticle. And in order to do this, or the trick that we need to consider here is to have a closer look at these parts here, the dielectric functions of the particle and of the medium. So let me briefly um, go to the blackboard. So what we will discuss is the resonance that occurs in metal nanoparticles. And you will see this is known as localized Okay, again, let me just show you this alpha again. Four pi d cube, R one minus uh, epsilon one minus epsilon two, particle and medium divided by epsilon one minus two epsilon. Let's not make a mistake. Let's call it particle here and medium, so we don't confuse it with the real and imaginary part. epsilon medium. And we also know that the scattering cross-section, see scattering, is proportional, among other things, to alpha squared. Okay, so long story short, the scattering depends on this product here. So now let's again compare the ref uh, these epsilons for metals and dielectrics and just focus on the real part. as a function of omega. So for metals, last week we derived such a function. Here's the plasma frequency and we saw, and let me again highlight this in red because it's important, we, this can be negative. Why for dielectric materials, We have previously seen that epsilon 1 as a function of omega, again here's 0, looks something like this. So it has always these small oscillations whenever we have, um, if we hit a resonance, either like a electronic transitions or vibrations and so on, but it's always larger 0. So it cannot be negative. And now we see this fundamental difference between noble metal particles and dielectric particles. Because, hang on, there's a mistake here. This should be a plus. Because we see that this denominator here compares the dielectric functions of metals or of the particle with the one uh, of the surrounding dielectric medium. So now, if this is a typical insulating medium, so nothing that is absorbing too much, like air, water, liquids, where we generally not metals, and this is a metal, then this become, can become negative. And if this can become negative, then we see that this uh, denominator here can approach zero. It will never be completely zero because it's actually a complex number, and this is only the real part, but nevertheless it becomes very small. And if it becomes very small, then you see that alpha becomes very big, or you can get a lot of polarization. So the electrons can very efficiently absorb the, absorb the electromagnetic radiation. And if alpha becomes very large, then the scattering becomes very large as well. And by the way, the absorption as well, also this is related to the imaginary part. Okay, so this is really the trick. The scattering becomes very large because we can create a resonance situation. So let me just write this here again. Maybe these two together means that a resonance 
situation is possible. And again, it's only possible for metals, not for dielectric materials. Now let's find this um, condition for resonances. So this is known as the Fröhlich criterion. It's very simple. We ask when will this denominator here approach zero or be minimized. And this is whenever epsilon particle equals minus two times epsilon of the surrounding dielectric medium. Okay, then we expect to observe a resonance and very strong scattering of light. So now let's find the wavelength. Wavelength or frequency. So we simply need to figure out how epsilon of particle looks like at the position where it's equal to minus two times epsilon of the medium. And we know that epsilon particle for a metal particle, maybe let's specify this again, for metals, epsilon particle, and we make this epsilon one, so the real part of the dielectric function as a function of omega, equals one minus omega p square divided by omega square. And remember, this, is, this was the last result we derived in the last lecture for the Trude model. This is in the limit that omega is larger than tau, the um, electron relaxation time, and this holds for at least the visible range and anything higher. Okay, so this means now we can replace this by two epsilon, two epsilon medium, and this equals one minus omega p square divided by omega square. So now we can slightly rearrange. So we bring this to this side and this to this side, and we yield omega p square divided by omega square is one plus two epsilon medium. And now we can resolve this by multiplying with omega squared and then dividing by this, and we get an expression for omega at resonance. And this is, so this was omega squared, is this one divided by this one. So omega will be the square root of omega p squared divided by one plus two epsilon medium. And this expression gives us the frequency of the resonance. And as I said, this resonance is called the localized surface plasmon resonance, LSPR. What does it mean, localized surface plasmon resonances? Plasmons are general oscillations that occur in the electron gas of a metal. And now because that electron gas is confined to a very small particle, it's localized. And this is why we call it localized surface plasmon resonance frequency. Okay, so this is really the conditions that we need to fulfill to get a very strong resonance. And this only is possible in metal nanoparticles. Okay, that's very important. Okay, so now having, having established this kind of criteria, we can really look at how the optical properties of a metal uh, differ from a dielectric particles and how we can explain the color that we find, for example, in the Lycurgus cup or in medieval church windows. So let's go back to our slides. So this is what I just derived on the blackboard. We see that we get the strong enhancement. This is the localized surface plasmon resonance. 
And here we have our wavelength with which we can compute this. Okay, so now I brought something for you. This is what um, this is gold nanoparticles, a solution of gold nanoparticles, and you realize it's almost transparent, so there's not a lot of scattering, it's very small particles, around about 10 nanometers, and it has a very clear red color. Okay, so I leave this here because we will need this in a second and just show this to you again. So this is the same sample that I just gave you. This is the particles, no, this is gold. You see 50 nanometers, so they are around about whatever, 10 to 20 nanometers. And if I now take a spectrum of these red particles here, this is how, this is how it will look like. So we get a very clear peak here, but we also get kind of a, a higher extinction or higher scattering at low parts of the spectrum or high frequency parts and we get much less um, scattering or extinction at high wavelength parts or low frequency parts here, so in the red part of the spectrum. And as we take out the green part at around about 510 uh, or so nanometers, the whole sample looks red. Now this is what, what happens if you have selective, spectrally selective absorption. And now we clearly see two fingerprints. First, we see the fingerprint of Rayleigh scattering. This is this one here. So this uh, dependence of the scattering intensity with lambda to the power of minus four, so more scattering at low lambdas and less scattering at high lambdas, higher wavelengths, very clearly seen here. Plus, we see this additional resonance that now only occurs for metal nanoparticles. And this gives rise to this very defined peak that we can calculate according to this localized surface plasmons, plasmon resonance wavelength. Okay, so now you see the fundamental reasons why gold is red and the same solution of silica particles that I showed you a few uh, lectures ago is just milky or bluish. Now, bluish if you have a little scattering, milkish if it becomes more and more and you scatter all wavelengths, but it can never have a different color. And here you see the gold is very clearly red. Okay, so now we know the color of gold. Let's just look at the color of silver. So what you see here, this is a solution of silver nanoparticles, has a very strong and pronounced um, plasmonic peak. And the difference between these two, you see that the plasmon peak changes in wavelength. Here it's around about 400 nanometers. For gold, it's around about 510 nanometers. Simply stems from the difference in the plasma frequency. Now if you go back to our blackboard, you see that the plasma frequency here goes into the localized surface plasma resonance wavelength. And if we change the plasma frequency by changing the numbers of free electrons, for example, we shift this um, position back and forth. So this explains the difference in color between gold and silver that we see here very clearly. Okay, there's something else that we can see in our localized surface plasma resonance frequency. And that is, it also depends on the dielectric environment. So the refractive index or the dielectric function of the medium, so of the surrounding of the particle, goes into the equation. That means if I change this dielectric environment, if I change the refractive index of my medium, I would expect to see a shift in this resonance wavelength. Now let's look at whether this hypothesis holds. And for this I brought you an image of gold nanoparticles here that are in air, in blue, in water, water has a refractive index of 1.33 approximately, and in oil, that has a typical refractive index of around about 1.5, so higher than water. And very clearly you see that the resonance wavelength from air shifts to the red if you now go into water, and then again it shifts a bit further if you go into oil. So this is really a consequence of this dependence of the localized surface plasma on resonance wavelength or frequency on the refractive index of the medium. And we will see in the next lecture that we can use this to actually um, infer or learn something about the dielectric environment, so about kind of the material that the nanoparticle is surrounded with by looking at the change in wavelength. Or in other words, you can build a sensor from that. Okay, so now this explains kind of the, this um, LSPR criterion. But what we cannot explain to this point is how this resonance wavelength 
depends on size or shape or maybe distance to other particles. If you remember this picture that I showed you at the beginning of last week, uh, last week's lecture of this um, real color image that was generated by different nanoparticles arrayed, then you saw that sometimes the distance changed and this changed the color. So the distance to other particles seems to affect the resonance wavelength. And in order to, do this, to discuss this, we cannot really use the simple Rayleigh scattering image or a really um, simple scattering theory provided by Rayleigh. If the particles become larger, then we cannot use this um, electrostatic approximation, and then everything becomes more complicated. And we've seen that we can use me theory to actually really solve Maxwell's equation and then get the complete optical properties of such a nanoparticle. And this can be done by different theories, discrete dipole approximation, finite difference time domains, or FTT simulations, or finite elements. All of these I do not want to discuss in this lecture because it's much too specialized and becomes much too time-consuming and complex to be covered in this introductory lecture. Long story short, um, what I just want to show you is there is possibilities to actually compute this, and you will see some examples of this later. What we want to do now is rather discuss these shifts in resonance very qualitatively to give you kind of a picture and a feeling on how these particles change. So let's first look at the size of the particles. Here's an image of gold nanoparticle solutions. This one you've seen, and now these researchers have increased the size more and more. And what you see is that the color very drastically changes. And when you measure the spectra, you see exactly this. So with larger sizes, the resonance wavelength shifts more and more to the red, and eventually it also becomes a bit more complex. Now this you see here. And this is exactly at the largest, um, uh, largest particle diameters where you cannot use this electrostatic approximation at all. Okay, and before, you can simply picture this behavior as one where the resonator, so you see that the electrons oscillate back and forth, becomes larger and larger, and the larger resonator means a lower wavelength. Now you can picture this if you look at the, at the guitar with different strings, the sound gets um, higher and higher pitched, the closer or the smaller you make the resonator. And the larger you make the resonator, the, the more, the lower the frequency that is emitted by, by the guitar. Same thing here, very small guitar, small oscillator gives um, a high frequency, a large oscillator gives a low frequency. Okay, so you see this is exactly what I said, and then if it becomes even larger, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Good, okay, so we see the resonance wavelength shifts with particle size, to the red part of the spectrum. So lower frequencies, higher wavelength. Let's now change the shape of the particles. And if you do this, here's a picture of gold nano rods, so very small rods made out of gold. And what we see in the extinction spectra here, that we have two distinct peaks, peak number one and peak number two. And again, we also see this difference between high and low wavelength side that comes from Rayleigh scattering. So why does a gold nanorod have two resonance frequencies now? Take a minute and think about this and think about the difference between a rod and a sphere and how this could relate to these two resonance frequencies. Okay, we have already established for a sphere that the resonance wavelength changes if you change the size of the sphere or the length of the resonator. And now if we compare a rod to a sphere, then we can distinguish two different resonator sizes. We have one length that is across here, so small length, and we have one length that goes across the entire um, length of the resonator, so a longer distance. And these two distances give two different resonance wavelengths. So you see this here. This is again the electric field. For a sphere, it doesn't really matter in which way you orient the the electric field, it always gives the same resonance because of the isotropic shape of the, the um, sphere. For a rod, now it depends on how the rod is aligned with respect to, it, to the electric field. If you place it like this, then the electric field will shift the electrons up and down, but only in the width of the rod, or the thickness if you want. And if the rod is aligned in parallel to the electric field, the electrons can, be, can oscillate across the entire length of this rod. And you see clearly here you have a much longer reson resonator length, and this translates into um, a lower wavelength 
or so a higher wavelength or a lower frequency. Again, very similar to the guitar picture. And now, if these rods are in solution, they are of course free to rotate and move in all different directions. So if you macroscopically shine light into the sample, you hit some rods that coincidentally are currently aligned in this way, and some rods are aligned in this way, and this is what gives you these two resonance wavelengths. So transversal mode across, and longitudinal mode along the shape of the particle. And if this, if this is true, we should be able to verify this model by selectively changing one of these length scales. So you could imagine if we now make samples that always have the same thickness, then this resonance should not change. But if we change the length of the rod, then this mode should change because we make the rod longer and longer. So the distance between here to here changes. And that means the resonator length changes. And we would expect to see a shift at this resonance. And indeed, this is what researchers have done. So you see here in these samples, different gold nano rods that are almost spherical, and now they become longer and longer and longer. And this experiment was conducted in a way that the width, so here, the, the thickness of the rods was close to constant. And what you now see is, first of all, for these different samples, you get different colors. So you already see that something in the spectra is changing. And if you look now closely and you measure the spectra, then you see that this peak here hardly changes. No, it changes a little bit for, for the first one. But after this, it remains very clear. So those are a little bit thicker. And then they rearrange to a constant thickness. So the transversal mode does not change at all. But this longitudinal mode, so the mode that goes along the contour length, becomes larger and larger and larger for increasing what thicknesses. OK. So this um, happens when you change the shape of the gold nanoparticle. So the next thing we want to discuss is what happens if you change the distance between particles. And for this, I want to start with a little experiment. Maybe make the background a bit darker. So again, I'm starting with my gold nanoparticle solution. And Eric can maybe check if he can see this well. And while he does so, I'm getting something here. So this is simply salt. And I'm choosing a calcium salt because this is very effective at this. And what I'm going to do now is I'm putting this calcium salt into my solution of gold nanoparticles. So let's try to do this. And what you see is a color change to blue. Well, I think it's very clear. OK, so I added salt, and it changes to from a red color to a blue color. So very clear to see. What happened? So now in order to fully explain this, we first need to understand what happens if you add salt to colloidal dispersions. And this is not really part of this lecture, but what you do is that you destabilize the particles and you cause them to aggregate. So what I did in this experiment here is I went from individual particles that are free to move in the solution, and this gave, gave me a red color, and then I added salt. And then I went into a state here is individual particles. Particles, they have a red color, and here I have agglomerated. And suddenly I observe a blue color. So now our task is to figure out what is going on in this experiment. And just to demonstrate this a little bit nicer, I give you a second experiment. So this experiment has been done a few years ago in the group of Hahn et al. And they did the same thing. So this is what I just showed you. 
here is pure gold. Now we added, or they added, um, salt, and it becomes blue. That's exactly what we did as well. And now they cast this blue particles in a film. And now when they applied pressure, so kind of pushed on the film, then it went back to red again. So you get two color shifts, blue to red to blue, and then blue to red. So now let's see what's going on. If we, if we have these agglomerated particles in our solution here after salt addition, that means also in the film. And as we stretch on the film, we separate the particles again. And as we separate them, we go from blue all the way back to the red color. So what we do in this, or what they do in this experiment is make this transition reversible. We just went from here to here, and now with our experiment, we unfortunately cannot go back, but they, by embedding this in, in a continuous matrix, they went from here back to here. So what's going on? You see, if you add salt, then we have this blue color. This is the film before pressing. And we see that instead of this one resonance, we suddenly have two resonances, and the uh, primary, or the, the biggest resonance is around about six to 700. This is this peak here. And if you absorb at six to 700, this is the red part of the spectrum, then what remains is the blue part, hence, the solution looks blue. So apparently, the agglomerated particles give rise to a peak in the red part of the spectrum. And you see that not all particles are agglomerated in their experiment, so there's some free particles left. They still give kind of a smaller peak over here. But predominantly, agglomerated particles have a peak in the red, while separated particles, so if you press or stretch, then it recovers the initial wavelength at 510 nanometers approximately, so the wavelength shifts back and forth. So the question is, this is also what you see here, that a change in interparticle distance translates into a shift in the localized surface plasmon resonance. And now the question is, why, where does the shift come from? And also here, I only want to give you a qualitative explanation. And there is, if you want, two types of pictures or two types of explanations on what is happening. So the first one, let's make some, some space. Shift of resonance, let's call it by proximity. So if our particles are close together, we get a shift to lower frequencies. So two qualitative pictures that we can use to explain this. The first one I would call a physical picture. in a single particle excited by an, by an electric field. We get this resonance here. Let's say the electric field sits like this. And I shift the electrons with respect to the nucleus. And this starts then to give rise to a resonance. And let's call this here lambda for wavelength of a single particle. Now, if I have a lot of particles, let's just put them all next to each other. Then all of these particles start to oscillate. Now, again, the electric field is coming from here. So now I displace these electrons a little bit, and I displace these electrons a little bit. So minus and plus, and here's a plus again, and a minus, and again. So I always have these electrons. Let's just make, maybe make the, the negative part red here. 
and let's make the positive part green. So now you see that compared to a single particle, each of these oscillations that occurs here to here is actually weakened because here I only have one driving force and this is the attraction of these electrons to these positive charges. Here for these electrons I have two attractions. One is to the actual particle but I also have a slight attraction to the neighboring particles. And that means that the restoring force exerted by one of these nuclei, one of these particle nuclei, or the ion cores, is weakened. So if the restoring force is weakened, we remember that omega zero is k over m. K is the spring constant, m is um, the mass of the electron. If k is weakened, then we see that this omega will decrease. So this would explain very clearly the transition. Let's just call it for an agglomerate. I get a lower frequency, and a lower frequency is a higher wavelength. So this would then mean lambda aggregate. So I get a shift. to lower energy. And lower energy means higher wavelength or lower frequency as we have it here. So a very simple picture to describe this. Let me give you a, an, another picture that describes the same phenomenon, maybe from a slightly different perspective. I would call this a chemical picture. And this is what is known as plasmon hybridization. So what do I mean by this? We picture a single um, oscillator again. Again, we have the same field of the wave. So the wave travels in this direction, you know, and oscillates kind of like this. So at a certain time, the electric field is oriented in this direction. And we get one particle that has charge separation in this way. And now we have a second particle that also has the same charge separation. Now in chemistry, we would picture these as the atomic orbitals of two individual atoms. And if they fo now form a molecule, which is when we put these two entities very close together, their individual orbitals will hybridize to form a molecular orbital. And now in our case, now we can do the same thing. If we bring our particles close together, we assume that they now form a new joint plasmon resonance, which is a hybrid resonance or um, the analog to a molecular orbital. So a molecular plasmonic resonance. And the way we can do this is by making linear combinations of the two different orbitals. So I can either have a sum, hang on, what, what did, I do? did I do here? Plus minus, so this is of course the same resonance. So I can either combine the two parental plasma modes, so the atomic orbitals in a, in a linear combination, this plus this, or I can, can combine it in the different linear combination, this one minus this one. And if I do this, I can I get these two things. One is one is the one linear combination, plus minus, and again plus minus, so the positive one or the additive one, and then the other one is 
the negative analog, and now I need to go down a little bit. And this would be plus, minus, and now the negative of this, so minus, plus. So these are the two possible linear combinations. And now since our particles are close together in this aggregated form, we know that, that these things must occur. But in order to excite a resonance, we need a dipole. Now this is what we've been discussing all along, that this dipole, what you have here, is really, or the possibility to form a dipole means that you can create an oscillating dipole, and this oscillating dipole radiates an electric field, which is what we know as scattering. Okay, and a, a resonance is the same thing. I also need to find a dipole. And now let's see where the dipole is that can be excited by the electric field. Here, a dipole always runs from plus to minus. So here I have clearly a dipole. So this can be excited. by the electric field of light. But here, I do not have a dipole. So you see, I, well, at least I have two dipoles, but they cancel each other out. So I have no resulting dipole moment. So that means that this resonance here cannot be excited. And this then means if I look at the spectrum, I get a very similar occurrence. So here I have, um, by the way, this is extinction or intensity or whatever. And this is wavelength again. And also here I should label this thoroughly wavelength. And here again, if I go from the single atom orbital or single parental plasmon resonance that looks like this, now the, of the two possible linear combinations to form a hybrid um, plasmonic orbital or a molecular orbital, I only excite the one that has a lower energy, which is the one that shifts to here. So this again would mean that here is the dimer, and here is the single particle. And this dimer comes from this resonance. So both explanations qualitatively yield exactly the same, um, well, both models yield the same explanation. In the chemical picture, we only excite the, the binding molecular orbital, so the lower energy mode. In the physical picture, we weaken the resonance frequencies by an additional electrostatic attraction of other surrounding particles. So this is why we get this shift from red to blue color. Okay, so now, so again you see the physical picture, and you have this partial compensation, and you see the chemical picture with these two different possible excitations. So whatever can be excited is known as a bright mode when it has a dipole moment. Whatever cannot be excited because it doesn't have a dipole or a, a, a complete dipole, it's known as a dark mode. Okay, so now, um, first of all, we can test this idea if we change the distance between these two particles in both models, it should, like the smaller the distance, the more pronounced should be the effect. And this is indeed what people have done. So they make or made gold nanoparticles with small shells that separate the particles. And then if we let them aggregate or agglomerate, then the shells separate the cores from direct contact. So this is what you see here. So you can make the shell thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker. And what you see is the thicker the shell, or the smaller the shell, the more you get a change in color. So you see this very clearly here in the spectra. Large shells do not give a change in color. The resonance is still at 510 nanometers approximately. And the larger you make the shell, the more this resonance shifts to the red, exactly as we predicted by our model. Okay, one last aspect that I want to talk about for these uh, plasmonic resonances is that not only does the color shift, also the particle acts, if you want, as a magnifying class for the electromagnetic field. 
So this is what you see here. At the resonance, a lot of these energies of the incoming light wave is now focused at the particles. And it's not only focused directly in the particles, but mostly at the tips or parts of the field where the electrons oscillate. So that means at this wavelength, there's a very strong interaction of the particle with the, the incoming light wave. And a lot of electric energy or electromagnetic energy is focused very strongly at certain parts of the surface of the nanostructure. Not simply where you excite this dipole, and this is where the electrons always os oscillate. And you can also simulate this. This is now finite element simulations of a gold sphere. And you see, in this case, the polarization is in this direction. So you very clearly see that the electric magnetic field is much higher here and here compared to the surrounding. And in this case, approximately a factor of five higher. And this is known as um, uh, an enhancement of the electromagnetic field energy. And now we can tune this enhancement and tune the position where we see this enhanced electromagnetic energy. So if you want, we create a magnifying glass at a very, very small length scale. And this is known as electromagnetic hotspots. So the distribution of the electromagnetic near field is not uniform, but really enhanced in certain locations. Again, we see this here for a sphere. Those are the locations. Now, if we put two spheres together, all the field is very much focused in this gap between the two spheres, what you see here. Okay, again, this is a result of this hybridization so that these two local uh, surface plasma and, um, plasma and resonance modes now are combined and it forms a new mode that is very intense in this part here. And you see, not only is it very intense in some part, in a very defined part, but it all also gets much higher. So now the enhancement factor is above approximately 10 if you compare the color code from here to the outside. So you see that you can make a hotspot, like a very defined region of high energy, by making dimers. And you can also change the shape of the particles. So here I'm comparing, again, a single sphere that you've seen before with a crescent-shaped nanoparticle. And this crescent-shaped nanoparticle has very strong tips. A gold nanowatt would, would have somewhat similar tips. And the smaller the tip, it's a bit like a lightning rod effect, the higher the electric field surrounding it. And here you see that the electric field now in these tip regions exceeds 30. So there's 30 times more electromagnetic energy focused at this tip region compared to everywhere else. And this is known as electromagnetic hotspots. Okay, so with this, I'm at the end of today's lecture. And now let's briefly summarize all these interesting properties of metal uh, or noble metal nanostructures. First of all, we see we can get a resonance in the polarizability because the real part of the dielectric function for metals can be negative. And this gives rise to this resonance that is known as the localized surface plasmon resonance. And we've seen that this resonance is very sensitive to the material, gold or silver, the size of the particles, the shape of the particles, and the surroundings. So if you have very um, small distances to, to other gold nanoparticles or metal nanoparticles. And we also seen that this plasmon resonance is a component or a different aspect of this resonance is the electromagnetic field is strongly enhanced at this resonance condition. And this enhancement is strongly focused at very defined areas or regions of the particle. And in the next lecture, we will discuss the consequences of these behaviors in different applications. Until then, I thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you.